<laughs> Feedback. <laughs> Check. Um, all right. So thank you for coming to this event tonight. Um, I want to thank our panel as well. I'm going to go through with inter introducing everyone. But uh, tonight's panel is about uh, working in post sound for television and film. Um, this came together through conversations with Carrie and Jet and April, um, where we really wanted to identify for the Sound Girls organization the fact that maybe some of you are interested in pursuing uh, a job or a career in post and you don't know that first step on the path to get there. Um, some of you may be looking to transition into a different job because some of you have been touring and it's time to get off the road. Whatever the situation is, our, our intent was definitely to help give some uh, guidance and advice on how to step into this career. Um, we are very fortunate with the talent we have up here because um, these are ladies that have been doing this for many years and they've really made a name for themselves in what they do. Um, and all of, I would say all of their paths, it's not straight. It's got the twists and turns and I think we can all relate to how that goes. So, um, by the way, my name is Ann Slack, <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> thank you. I have known uh, most of <laughs> these ladies for many years. I've known Carol for quite a while. I would love her to be my my wife if, <laughs> if she'll have me. Um, Kate, Kate and I have corresponded for years uh, through her company, uh, Boombox, right? Yes, and um, me from working at the Motion Picture Sound Editors. And then Anna, Anna, I have known from when she was a recordist when it was 4MC, right? Or was it Ascent? Radford. Radford, okay, yeah. And, uh, and then now she is a re-recording mixer on a show you may have heard called Game of Thrones. Um, and uh, then we have April down here. Um, April and I have only just really uh, gotten to know each other, but she is a total Jill of all trades, and I think you guys are going to be very impressed to hear about um, all the things that she does. Like, she's, she's going to stay busy. She's a hustler. Always. Yes. <laughs> she's a hustler. Um, so... I guess without further ado, now that you know what our intent of this was to be, um, Carol Urban, um, <laughs> she is a re-recording mixer, but she has also, uh, she is as well a sound editor. Um, she does a lot of dialogue editing, um, but she also does effects editing as well, so she's kind of a... A triple threat there. <laughs> I hop around. <laughs> I stay employed. <laughs> um, and uh, I told her earlier that she had uh, my daughter went over with the fact that she worked on River Monsters. <laughs> um, and she knows how much I loved her work on the TV show Kingdom. If any of you ever saw that, it was an amazing show. Um, and let's see. One of the things that we talked about, um, oh, I, I'm sorry, I should touch back on. She is also um, Shondaland. Shondaland. Oh, well, not all of Shondaland. Not all of but Shondaland. <laughs> that's Shondaland a lot of Shondaland. Her, yeah. <laughs> she works on Grey's Anatomy. I'm blessed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you're blessed. Grey's Anatomy. Um, and uh, Station 19, watch the new one. The new one's really good. Season two is coming out. I'm yes. very pumped. Lots of fire, fire show, fire show. <laughs> And she was sound editor on Scandal. Yep. Yes. So um, she actually works very closely with that whole group. And I would say um, they have a lot of trust and faith in her and her abilities. Um, and uh, she likes them as, you know, great clients that are. They're, they're awesome. Yeah. yeah, they're awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm really blessed. 
one of the things Carol and I talked about was just this uh, being well-rounded, this concept of uh, coming up and learning to do sort of all the components mm -hmm. and um, how that has translated into a, a career that she now you know, has and works very steadily. Um, she has also gone through being an independent contractor, working for facilities. Oh, yeah. yeah, I've worked on a I've worked on a couple lots and I've worked for my own company and uh my partner, uh my hubs is around here somewhere. He's a supervisor right there. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we we have a company and yeah, we work He's on nice separate guy. jobs, jobs together. Yeah, we make a lot of racket. Yeah, you don't want to be our neighbor. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um all right, so next we have Kate Finnan. Is it Finnan or Finan? Finan, I apologize. Kate Finan. Um, she's a co-owner of Boombox Entertainment, um, and they do a lot of work in animated series. Um, they are very fortunate. Uh, not only do they do their own work with their own clients, but they also get contracted by Nickelodeon, Disney, um, and yeah, uh, DreamWorks, Hasbro, Bros. Netflix, Amazon. Yeah. And so, um, uh, and I can attest as a business owner from when I was a business owner, being able to have that sort of relationship where you don't just have to rely on what you're going after and what your uh, own staff is working on, but to have that relationship with other studios, it's vital. And it's, and it's great because it really keeps the work well-rounded and dynamic in the facility. Um, right now, she's currently working on some projects such as Muppet Babies, and <laughs> um, which I used to watch, the old one. Um, and then, uh, let's see, sorry about that, no, Lion Guard. Um, Mickey and the Roadster Racers. Um, and Stretch Armstrong. I, Stretch Armstrong I did yeah. recently, too. Yeah, for Netflix. So Lion Guard, that looked like it was... Based on Lion King? It's a spinoff of The Lion King. Okay. It's uh, two generations later, I guess. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's so, it called? It's called uh, The Lion Guard. You're going to mm -hmm. know it because your kid's probably going to yeah. watch it. <laughs> yeah, I work, I don't know if we mentioned, but I do sound for animation specifically. Um, so it's a lot of children's television, um, as well as we do some adult swim things, too. Cool. Yeah. They're, they're getting ready to have an adult swim con, which I just heard advertising oh, really? for. And I was like, that sounds like fun. Yes. <laughs> Mastodon's playing there. It's going to be great. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, one of the other things Kate and I were talking about, and, and I can relate to this as well, is uh, having being a business owner. One of the perspectives she's able to bring, uh, hopefully for uh, information for you and if you have questions, but... Um, it's going to be a perspective of hiring people. She, you know, she is someone who looks for staff, um, looks for independent contractors, things like that. And so she's going to be able to offer to you some advice and information on, you know, maybe how to come to that interview or how to prep for uh, a meeting with her. Um, then we have Annalie Blank. Very, uh, very good mixer who just won an Emmy. Congratulations. Another Emmy. Another, another Emmy. Another Emmy. <laughs> very well deserved. Um, Anna, yeah, Anna has worked her way up. And uh, like I said, originally knowing her as um, a recordist, which is a fairly... I made coffees too. Yes. <laughs> Delivered bagels. <laughs> There is that too. Um, but it was a, it's a technical position that you start out in to get, you know, familiar with the mixed stage and get that crew familiar with you and gain confidence in you. And you start to get exposed to clients who see you as part of the process. Um, I was also curious on some of your credits, you had sound designer mm -hmm. and I've always known you on sort of the dialogue into things, but I didn't know that your sound design stuff, was it more effects oriented, music oriented, dialogue? Um, I s started off doing sound design before I was mixing. Yeah. So if I sound supervise a film, I'll sound design it. 
but I don't want to mix my sound design. Sure. I like to mix dialogue because uh, I'll get tied to it. And then if it's not working, I'm going to really try hard to make it work. Right. And so it's better just to have another set of hands on something that I create because then I can just be like, oh, it doesn't work. Okay. Oh, I spent five hours. Right. On that. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that, that is something as, um, as an editor, you got to get used to letting go. Like the as a mixer. Yeah. Well, yeah. But once you hand it off to the stage, like they're, you know, music's going to win. The so. muter comes in. <laughs> Hi, I'm the muter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, Anna, uh, what a career. I mean, you've had, I, I have in my notes, uh, seven, uh, award wins and, 16 nominations and of those wins three of them are emmys and like four said, four yeah <laughs> well she just had one just, just that's right night. yeah that's just right it yeah, didn't yeah. update yet sorry <laughs> four four I'm out of here she is badass <laughs> <laughs> um so as i said she's uh works on game of thrones and um other shows that she worked on with hbo girls which those are two totally opposite type of shows i'm sure you you see that. Um, she recently worked on a film that I happened to really love, which was I Feel Pretty. Ah, I, I mean, yeah. it didn't get the love it should have. I loved it. Um, and then um, Black Sales, I totally forgot that you were a mixer on that. Yeah. Um, and you work with uh, one of my old employees, Ben Cook. Yes. Love Ben. Ben's great. Pirate show. Lots of Lots beautiful of men with their shirts off. <laughs> <laughs> the sound is great too <laughs> the sounds really good yes um and then uh and then to sort of like offset that as well with um you also just worked on christopher robin and so yeah. i i find it really interesting the you know the the dynamic and difference of the resume and that and that goes for everyone up here and that's something that uh you're gonna find as you're in your career path is that you definitely don't want to get pigeonholed into some sort of genre. Yeah. And so you just get open to saying yes to like, yeah, I'll work on that and I'll work on that. And it really helps develop you. Um, on to April down here. Like I said, April's a Jill of all trades. I was fascinated to learn that she did the violin solo in Miss Congeniality 2. <laughs> <laughs> So she's a virtuoso, I guess. Um, but she, uh, talk about someone who really embodies that saying yes and, uh, you know, saying like that job. Sure, I can do that job. She has, uh, she's a sound editor. She's a sound supervisor, a music editor, a music mixer, an ADR mixer, and a re-recording mixer. So, oh, and Foley. I think we forgot oh, that. We forgot Foley. Yeah. <laughs> I don't do it much anymore, but I used to. Yeah. And currently she is working for FX Network. FX Network. So, yep. Yeah. And um, let's see. Oh, you were in the beginning of my book. <laughs> um, and I got familiar with you just last year because you were nominated for Motion Picture Sound Editor Awards, two of them. Uh, and, uh, it was new radical and also motivation three. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And so I, I remember going back and forth with her so she could have seats at the table with certain people <laughs> with the people yeah. I worked with. That's kind of nice. I, I yeah. tried to accommodate everyone. Um, and, uh, let's see what's interesting too, again, with that, not getting, um, pigeonholed into a certain genre, she has done reality she has done documentaries she has done animation she has done short films she has done live action so web she says yeah. yes yeah. <laughs> web corporate it's kind of like if it's audio and it sounds cool i'm in um so i gave these ladies some questions that i thought would hopefully uh be pertinent to maybe uh the direction that we're intending with this panel and uh you know also could be fun to to get some background and learn on uh how these women got to where they are now um one of the questions was what was that moment or what was 
the thing that made you decide, yeah, I want to work in post-production. I want to be a mixer. I want to be an editor. Carol? Is it, okay, all right. <laughs> um, first. Um, uh, well, uh, I knew that I wanted to work in audio, but I'm from Southern Virginia, and it's a very small town. If I was going to work in post, it would probably be like the 700 Club or Pat Robertson or something. That wasn't going to happen. No, it's just not me, man. Um, so so, um, so I, um, I, I knew that I wanted sound, and most of the, I think that was probably um, – I was uh, sight impaired as a child. Um, so, uh, I was actually, um, legally blind until about the age of five and I had an operation to correct that way before lasers, stitches in the eyes, yo. Um, so <laughs> it was, yeah, but, um, but I, I identify, um, uh, I identified people by the sound of them in my very early life and I identified, um, where things were located principally. I had kind of fly vision, I had optical input, but it was like multiple kind of floating images. I had muscular control issues. So when that was uh, fixed, uh, everything seemed really big, but sound was very safe and it's always been very safe. Um, so I did the traditional music thing, but I never really liked performing. I didn't recognize that there was really anything else you could do to make racket in life if you weren't going to perform because I'm from a small southern town and that's, you know, clearly if you're into sound, then you need to be a musician. Um, so I fell in love with the front of house and uh, there was actually, uh, when I graduated from a, an art school in high school, uh, it was kind of like a fame school kind of thing, the Governor's Magnet School. I was in performing arts and um, we were t had a touring musical after we graduated in Japan, which is a fabulous opportunity. Um, but uh, there was a situation where at one point they needed uh, someone to take control of the board due to uh, you know, emergency or what have with the individual who was hired. And I was nerding so hard on it that they <laughs> they were like, do you, would, you know, Carol, you should probably talk to whoever they're going to hire. And I'm like, why would you hire somebody I have an understudy? <laughs> so I'm like, you know, and uh, I think that was pretty much the last time I, I, I uh, really had to perform. And I, I went to college and, and focused on post-production because uh, I recognized not only could you do it for front of house, but you could also rewind and continue to mess with stuff, <laughs> which was really, really attractive. So, uh, so, uh, and I have a, a total nerdery for uh, film and television. I am the kid who won't go outside to play. So I made that my career and I went to college for it and I went out and I have been like a, you know, a dog with a bone ever since. It's, that's, that's what I do. This woman hustles. I know. She does. I know <laughs> from experience. I saw her at 2 a.m. once after doing a double shift, and she's like, I think I'm just going to stay up and go teach a class so that I can go do double shift tomorrow. I, mean, she was I was just... teaching spin class. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's very interesting because my, my brother was blind, actually. Yeah. Uh, he was born blind and was blind his whole life, and he is definitely the reason why I got into uh, sound. It's definitely why I uh, first ended up in music was mm -hmm. because watching him uh, teach himself how to play mm -hmm. multiple instruments and, you know, going into his room with the black light on and the Zeppelin poster and the Pink Floyd poster and just like, man, this is so cool. Um, but it, it was interesting because then when I turned to post and I would play for him these things that I was editing mm -hmm. and, you know, without the picture and he just, uh, his mind was blown. Like, yeah. it, it, like, and that was always my goal. Like when I taught uh, editors, um, I would tell them to turn off their monitor. Um, a lot of times I, I would edit backgrounds and fully, but, um, so atmospheres, uh, I really liked doing in sound design, but I would make the editors I was training turn off their monitors. And I'd be like, I should be able to know where we're at and what sort of mood is going on with the picture based off of what sounds you're putting in. Um, so that's really cool. Um, Kate, how about you? Um, so I feel like mine is a little bit more meandering. It's not as fantastic as Carol's. Um, but basically, I was a clarinet player, um, and I knew in high school that I wanted to go to a conservatory and be a musician. But I was sort of torn because I was really into math and physics as well. And I just like really wished that I could do both things. And I had a friend who, another woman who actually came to me and said, hey, I've heard there's like this major where you can go to a music conservatory at some schools around the country. And you can also just then major, get a bachelor's in science in 
sound technology, which I had never heard of um, being from Wisconsin. And again, you know, just being a musician. Um, And so I looked into it and I applied to a number of schools that were, had really good clarinet teachers and I could study and have the possibility of going on to be a classical musician, but um, also get a degree in this trade. And, um, I just, I fell in love with it. I did an internship in music, um, engineering, which was really what my program was geared toward. Um, and I had thought that I would be an engineer for classical music. And it turns out there's not really a big market for that out there. <laughs> I, there is here for being, if you're on the scoring stage or something, but, um, in a lot of other places, that's not, very popular. So rock music was not really my thing. Um, I found that out after recording a lot of bands all night long um, for free. So then I got an internship in post-production, which in Chicago, where I was, is largely commercials. And I realized that that was really a passion of mine, but commercials are really... um, tedious or they were for me. I'm sure they're, they're great work. Uh, but I, so I decided to, you know, drop everything, move to Los Angeles and try and work in the industry. And I, you know, everyone said, well, when you don't make it, just come home again. And I said, I'm, I'm never coming back here again. (laughs) And the rest is history. (laughs) So you made it to spite them all. (laughs) I I like it. Um, Anna, how about you? Any aha moment that led you down this path? Uh, where do you start? That's weird. Um, I used to dance with New York City Ballet. and um, But at the same time, I was really into going to my fish concerts and recording them. <laughs> so I got injured and the conductor of the ballet had showed me Pro Tools. Um, I didn't go to college. I moved after I was kind of didn't know what to do with my life. That's all I did was dance. Um, I looked up a trade school that was six months and I learned audio engineering randomly. Um, and it was like, everybody was there to make beats for Dre. And I said, you and your mom are going to make beats for Dre. Um, and then I got a job at, uh, the village recorder which is on the west side here and worked my way up to be an assistant engineer. And then I got hired by Rick Rubin and I worked with him for two years, worked on a lot of great records. Um, that nobody Rick Rubin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? That nobody, Rick that Rubin. nobody Rick Rubin. Yes. <laughs> um, it was, even though your work, I was working with like Johnny Cash and the only record I ever got fired off was, uh, chili peppers because Anthony Kiedis didn't want a woman engineer in the room. And, uh, I never got paid for that still. Um, (laughs) just invoicing record labels. I was eating chicken broth. Um, even though I was getting paid, it would become like eight months later. Um, and my friend was Danny Elfman's personal assistant. And she's like, Hey, Danny needs some help in the studio. And I was like, who's that girl for the elf? Um, (laughs) So I got hired and I built two of his studios and then worked with him on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Corpse Bride and recorded his vocals. And then I was like, oh, film is creative. And he wrote a letter to Tadio and that's how I got a job. And Tadio, I kept calling. I was like, you're the best, right? I should work at the best. We're not hiring. And so I just showed up one day with a letter written from Danny Elfman in a suit. I didn't know that people in post-production don't really dress up. Uh, and I got made fun of, like, you know, one, of the, one of the, you know, engineers that helps the studio is like, who's this girl coming in a suit? I was like, my mom told me to dress up for interviews. So <laughs> I got the job and it was working in the vault, which really was an ego death for me, because after working with on Johnny Cash's last record, I was like, can I log your tape? I was like, this sucks. And so I just was like, I'm going to get out of here as fast as I can. I think the first week there, I met some recordists because I heard that was a way that you can learn. And so I got hooked up and I started learning with Unsun, who works at Warner Brothers. And I was very intimidated by her. I think I still intimidated by her. (laughs) She's like, just knows her stuff. And she, um, talked very fast and I just (laughs) would come in early and stay late. And 
still log my tapes during the day. And a month or two after that, a small TV stage was looking for a new recordist. And I interviewed for the job internally in Tadio without my boss knowing when I said, hey, I'm going to work over at the other facility as a recordist. <laughs> he goes, you can't get that job. You've only been here three months. You have to sit in the vault longer. And I said, logging tapes is going to make me better at that. F off. And I left and I <laughs> became a recordist. <laughs> Let's just say we weren't very good friends after that, but that's okay. Um, worked at Tadio for a while and started doing sound design in the back room while working on free projects, started doing music editing. Then I was working on like 10 projects at once. Then I filled in and was working on the scoring stage. Um, then learned more about film and and then I was like, I'm never going to move up to be a mixer or a sound editor. Nobody's going to hire me. So I quit and I was a post supervisor <laughs> <laughs> or post coordinator on a TV show. I was like, I'll just have to work my way up and be a producer. That's how I can do it. Didn't realize that's not creative at all. And then I'm working on a pilot um, as a post coordinator and I brought in my Pro Tools rig. I was like, should I cut you guys some sound? They're looking, <laughs> looking at me like I'm crazy. Finish that project. Um, and then, you know, I was kind of floating. And then a mixer asked me if I'd want to, you know, try out to be an effects mixer. And I said, is this a joke? And he gave me a mixing interview. And I didn't really know what I was doing, but he hired me. And he really helped me. Uh, Andy D'Addario and on CSI New York and Brothers and Sisters. And then he, an excellent proponent for women. I also got to yeah, he really, he's a fabulous he is, man. Yeah, he, very talented. He great. He was a great mentor. Mozart and, in the Jungle, Transparent. Also, he mixes transparent, those. Transparent, yeah. yeah. Kingdom. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Great dialogue. He mixed with on Kingdom together. Yeah. And he got double booked. And so I said, well, why don't I just take over your shows? I'll mix dialogue. He was like, huh? I was like, come on. Just show me. Then I can be the boss. <laughs> <laughs> and so he sat down with me for a while and he showed me how to mix dialogue. And then I did those two shows. And then I was out of work for a while and I wasn't really getting jobs because I haven't really been doing it. And you look at my credits, it's like it just says really like a whole bunch of freebie short films and that you never heard of. And CSI New York. And people are like, eh, you know. When I first had my company, Widget Post, um, I think we were in our second, almost a third year, and uh, I was at this women in film event, um, and there was a panel of different women. Um, one of them happened to be Laura Hirschberg, and a uh, re-recording mixer. She's up at Skywalker. A rock star. Amazing yeah. mixer. Isn't she still the only female re-recording mixer to receive an Oscar? Is that correct? correct. That is correct. Yeah. Oh, Karen. Karen. Oh, well, no, no, no. no, no. Karen She's Baker sound is sound. Yeah, that's sound, sound editorial. Yeah. 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 Re-recording mixer. Re-recording. Re when Laura mixing. won, I was yeah. like, damn it. She got it first. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was, uh, it was interesting because when I, I remember talking to Laura saying like, really, you know, I mean, there's only a few female mixers in town. And, and at that time in 2002, uh, 2003, it was Sherry Klein who unfortunately could not attend tonight. Because she's working. Because she's working. <laughs> it was Melissa Hoffman. Mm -hmm. um, it was Laura Hirschberg. And uh, Debbie Dare. Debbie yep. Dare. Yep, yep. And Anna. Yep. And that was Anna Belmer. That was basically it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, Carol's right. We're at like 14 now. So Yeah. Salas. <laughs> <It's>, the number's <laughs> going up. It's happening. Yeah. <laughs> That's a decent brunch club. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, yeah, very inspiring, Anna. Thanks for sharing those stories there. Um, April. Don't tweet that story. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny. My path is actually kind of similar to Kate's in that I thought I wanted to be a classical violinist. I went to school a year for it, and I was like, I can't stand sitting in a practice room. But ironically, I could sit in a mix room for 16 hours and not even think twice about it. Um, 
I uh, I wanted to be a scoring mixer or you know even classical music mixer. Um, just I, I, I did a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and I, I was in maybe the last three months of my master's degree and um, did a recording with a, a really well-known producer. And I remember almost literally falling asleep during the session. And I was like, this is not for me, but I'm about to graduate. So what am I going to do? Um, I took a post-production class and I hated it. Um, in retrospect, it's because I just didn't... Um, the way they were presenting it, and you know, and if you're only getting it kind of piecemealed, it's hard to see that it's creative and that it can be, you know, it, as much of an outlet as music or art or other things. Um, so I graduated, I moved to LA. I was like, you know, I'll give myself six months. We'll see how it goes. Um, I knew three people. I put an ad on Craigslist and I was like, I want to be people who work in the entertainment industry. <laughs> I got about 80, 90 responses, uh, all from guys. <laughs> one of them is now my husband <laughs> yeah <laughs> he was an audio guy and he and he uh, uh he was like you know he said hey we should get together for a beer or 10 i'll show you know I'll, I'll show you my purple 1176 you know purple face 11 or whatever um <laughs> but he also he it turned out we had a mutual friend and so he kind of helped me introduce me to some people so i mean i basically can trace back everyone i know in the entertainment industry to these like three people that I knew in LA and I had someone help me kind of find some work in the classical music industry because I had some experience, you know, doing recording. So I got into places like UCLA, the Colburn school. Um, but I was like, you know, this is just, that's not the path I want to go on. I met a scoring mix mixer. Who's a, one of the, you know, still is one of the leading guys. And, um, and he said, I said, what would you do if you were me? He said, if I were you, I would go work in post-production. I wouldn't, go pursue a career in music right now. He said, you know, I have a, a kid, I have a mortgage and the stage I'm working at is dark for three months this summer. It's basically, you know, he's not working. And, and he said, and then, you know, you, in your free time, go do music and, you know, and then eventually, you know, you can build up into scoring. And that's pretty much what I did. I, I uh, took an internship at a, at a, uh, or actually it wasn't even an internship. I took a job selling equipment for, uh, from companies that were going out of business. So again, you know, I just moved to LA, I'm like gung ho and I'm helping inventory equipment, you know, mic collections and stuff because the studios are going under. Um, but through that, I met a, a studio owner of a post-production studio who, um, who they were like, Oh, you, you know, this, this, this facility, you know, like they were buying the building and, uh, and they're like, Oh, you know, the building, you know, what key goes to which thing, you know, how the alarm system works. Hey, can we hire you? Like, so it wasn't even because I had a master's degree in audio or that, you know, <laughs> I had connections. It was literally because I knew the, the security system. So they hired me as a PA and assistant scheduler. And this kind of goes to what Anne was saying earlier about just taking whatever opportunity comes your way. Um, you kind of got to, I remember George Massenberg, who's one of my professors saying to me once, he said, um, there's going to be a lot of good opportunities or there's going to be a lot of opportunities. You just have to pick the ones that you want. And I think that's good advice. You know, you kind of got to look at it like, what could this bring me? And so by being assistant scheduler, I'm picking up the phone or, you know, the, the studio owner is call, telling me, hey, can you call Vince and, and book him for a session tomorrow? So I'm getting to know the mixers. I'm getting to know why they're hiring the people they are. Um, and I'm also learning like, hey, if you're nice to the scheduler, you're more likely to get called. That is solid advice. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, and what I found since then is it's like, those are the people that, you know, I can be like, Hey, how much are you guys paying? Like, like, what's the, go like, seriously, cause that's a tough thing to know. Like, what should I be charging? Especially different stages in your career. So I was PA, which, you know, PA is basically, you know, picking up lunches, taking out the trash and, and similar to your experience, I'm going, I have a master's degree and I'm taking out the trash. So a uh, couple months in, there's a session supposed to start and a computer's down, like totally dead. And they've got all the mixers in there. They've got all the machine rooms. They got people, they got all the uh, assistants and, and they're just like, they cannot get this computer up and running. And it, you know, it has some session on it that they have to have in 15 minutes. And me being like, you know, total computer nerd. I'm like, you know, I kind of, I'm going, oh, should I say something or not? Has anyone tried like, you know, this, this thing? And I'm like, no, we haven't. So they try it, and sure enough, computer works. So that day I got my promotion into the machine room. <laughs> and, a, and a pay raise, too, I think. So, um, 
And in another, that's another one where it's like, if I would have seen a job listing for like machine room operator, I would have been like, why would I be doing that? But in retrospect, that's where I learned, like I met, I'd met a ton of mixers, editors, sound supervisors, um, producers, you know, like everyone, because back then everything was tape based. So like producer would come in, they'd hand you the tape, they'd go do their mix review, you know, with the mixer. And then afterwards they have to lay back everything to the tape. So then I'm having to listen, you know, for kind of doing quality control and, um, and then the producer, whoever comes back and they get the tape for me. So it's like they, they're putting a face to a name, which is something you don't really get if you're just like a sound editor or, you know, even a pre-dub mixer. You know, there's certain jobs where you just don't get that face time. Um, but yeah, from there, I, you know, I, I was at a facility where I just got, they, they had a Foley stage. So they were like, hey, do you want to do this Foley session? Sure. And they kind of coached me enough you know, to figure it out. That's where I learned how to do ADR. Um, I was assisting on a dub stage and that's another job that like, you know, you think about, oh, I'm going to be assisting. I got to sit in the back of the room while they're mixing these incredible shows. It was a, a two man or two person dub stage. Um, and even though I'm sitting in the back of the room, you know, and everything's bass heavy, I'm getting to see like, I'm seeing what the meters look like. Okay, the, the effects mixer hits play. And okay, well, he's doing his backgrounds and they're kind of sitting here on the meters. Or the dialogue mixer, okay, well, he's doing his pass like this. Or I can see what he's doing for his EQ on the screen. So even if I can't hear the same as like if I was sitting in the chair, there's still so much that you can learn by observing other people. And I think that's something that gets lost today where, you know, it's really easy to say like, oh, I'm just going to go be a sound editor and, and edit all my stuff and find all my work and work in my home studio and all that. Like there is something to be said about balancing, doing your own work and, you know, working for other people and learning from other people. Um, so pretty much from there, I, just, oh, I guess I should come back around. So a uh, good friend of mine, Darren Fung, who's a composer, uh, I met him in college in Montreal. Uh, I was doing my master's and he was finishing his, his degree in composition and I used to do recordings for him for pizza and beer. Um, and it was like, you know, short films, just little things. So that was how many years ago now? 15 years. Uh, he moved to L.A. He's doing incredibly well with his career. And he's like, hey, April, do you want to fly with me to Canada and record a 100-piece orchestra? Uh, I mean, he's invited me to China. I couldn't do that gig. But, like, you know, it's, it's these relationships of the people that I knew when I was just getting started that are now bringing me these really cool opportunities so it all it all comes back around full circle and I really am doing kind of what that mixer said which was like learn what you can you know if you have something you you really want to do just try to keep you know keep in the back of your mind but you know you'll eventually get there awesome. all right that's awesome um I think it helps us segue into my next question pretty well which is um each of you is going to have certain technical as well as uh, maybe soft skills or characteristics that apply to your job to, uh, I don't know, make the job uh, better for you, keeps you fired up on it, but also just it, it just makes it all work so it's easier for you. Mm -hmm. um, Carol, for what you do as an editor and as well as a re-recording mixer, what sort of uh, technical skills do you think are important to have to go into that? And then after that, what are sort of the soft skills that have helped you get the work? Um, I think the soft skills are actually key to getting the work. There's so many people who can do the job, who know how to do the job, um, that that's not a question. You just need to have that. Like that's a baseline. Like you need to know your, know your tools, know your technology, have some flexibility and workflows that you understand. You just need to always have that cycling. Like this summer I had a little time off. So I beta tested three pieces of software. You know what I mean? Cause you know, that's what you do. Right. You know what I mean? That's what you do. Yeah. You know, I, I read her blog, which is amazing. You know, like I, I, I listen to podcasts. I, you know, I nerd out, you know, I, I watch things over and over. I stop hit and play. And I, I, you know, I just finished a, a horror film. So I watched a bunch of horror films and I tried to look at what pop culture was saying was scary today because what's scary today isn't scary 10 years ago is, you know, and something can go from cheesy to terrifying and about five years, you know? Um, so <laughs> like, you know, you, know, you, you I, I observe and I, I nerd, but that's kind of baseline. Like that's what, that's like, if you're 
professionally competing, I feel like, yeah, that, yeah, you got to check all that. You like know, you don't need to put on your resume that you know Pro Tools. Yeah, if you you shouldn't if, even be applying. If you, you shouldn't don't. even be there. Yeah, you, you got to know that. Yeah, you just got to solid know that. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but um, the soft skills are really what gets you the job, and it's what maintains the job. Um, for instance, um, I, I feel like uh, I have uh, identified a new challenge recently in what I do as a re-recording mixer. Um, I feel like. I have established a good set of storytelling skills that I have observed through narratives that I enjoy, that I, that I have observed, other mixers, other things that they've employed, that they've taught me, conventions that are accepted subconsciously in the mind. My, my slogan, by the way, is I, I play mind games with sound. That's, you know, that there are psychological tricks that cue you in to feel certain ways. I feel like I have a, a pretty good palette of those tools to pull on and identify, but you're never going to be able to use those things or get, in that op get the opportunity to work on projects that allow you to have that level of creativity or that level of kind of narrative enhancement or co-content creatorship, that type of authorship, um, if you can't understand the vision of the person who is actually creating the film or the producer that's actually creating the product. Um, the right answer is the answer that fulfills their vision. Um, and that was, that was a really, um, that's a really hard lesson to learn when you're starting out, um, uh, because you may know that 98.9% .9 of whatever is going to respond to this, but the particular filmmaker responds to that. You have to remember that that producer and that filmmaker, this is, this is their project that they have put so much into that they're putting into your hands and your ears to manifest for them. So you, it's important to know your audience and that those so soft skills where you recognize who your audience is and you can communicate with them in a way that you can collaborate. And sometimes that means opening their minds to maybe a suggestion or, or a concept that you have where you're adding your experience and your observation onto the problem at hand or just, you know, explaining the physics of the situation, which is really the sad part. Like, sorry, that didn't hit micro, you know, <laughs> like that type of thing. But right now my, my professional challenge is I'm literally trying to put on the glasses and the hat of another person's taste, yeah. you know? So, so, uh, you know, whereas I go, oh man, I don't feel emotionally connected at all when we do that that person does. So I need to change my mind when I'm in the chair working for that person so that that does have that response to me. And at that point in time, I've seen real true masters. And I think I've had a, a handful of opportunities where I've really been very successful at this, but I see masters do it. Andy does it, um, where you're able to see the taste of the person that you are performing for. And you're able to put on their glasses their hat, think the way they would think and not only anticipate what they would want, which is actually not so hard. I'm quite good at that, but be able to suggest within the realm of the way that they think a solution that would solve another problem, come up with something that they would come up with if they had maybe the physics information or the, the tool information that is behind what you do. And that's the, that's the trick that, that that's, that's the real job. The real, I don't want people to hire me cause I can remove your hiss. I mean, I can remove your hiss, but you know, I, I want people to hire me because like, I want us to collaborate and create a story together. You know, I want us to suck some people in, you know, I want, I want to make people at the water cooler talk about the incredible scene that made them cry, the joke that made them laugh, the scene that made them jump. Like that's the goal, you know, and you want to manifest that from the person who had the inkling of that concept in their mind, the filmmaker and the producer. So that, it, that soft, that's the soft skill. That, that's what you need. Yeah, and Kate, I think this ties into what you were saying as far as being an employer. You know, you're going to be looking for certain skills and people uh, interviewing for entry-level jobs. Um, and so it sounds like and, and I've heard this, I've, I've spoke on a few panels and I've talked to some colleges as well. It seems like, you know, no Pro Tools, period. Yeah, definitely. Don't, don't show up needing to be taught Pro Tools. No one has time. Or, you know, show up needing to be taught Pro Tools to some extent for an internship or, you know, but we, we do get a lot of applicants who come in and they just graduated college or a short program somewhere, which um, is great. 
and they say, okay, well, I'm here to interview to be the supervising sound editor on all your shows. <laughs> and you would be surprised how often that happens. Um, that's, that's not realistic. But uh, <laughs> as far as, as skills, I would say, um, you know, you've heard all of us talk about how we, all the different jobs that we've had and the winding path that we got to where we are. And that's because in our industry, you're hired on a per project basis, really. Um, you're sometimes you're an employee somewhere, but a lot of times you're, you're in for one episode, you're in for just the run of a series or just one movie. And so you have to keep hustling. And the question is, um, what is going to bring those clients back to you when they go back to their offices for two years developing something? And then they have to remember like, Oh, who was that mixer who I really liked working with? Or who was that editor who I liked? Because I spent a lot of time in my beginning of my career hustling, having a lot of hiatuses off, spending nine months with no work and just trying to like pinch pennies and then getting another project that lasted for a couple of years and having the same thing happen again. And um, I feel like the best piece of advice that I got was when I was interning at honestly, like not the best internship in the world. But I was told your job is basically there's always downtime on a stage. And whether that's technical downtime, something's not working or just new materials have come in that need to be downloaded and it's going to take 15 minutes or whatever. Don't let the clients see that part of it. They don't need to know what's going on underneath the hood of the car. They should feel like they're there. They're hanging out. It's a party. They're having a good time. Well, all of that's happening. And that is a really difficult skill to master. So when I was interning, I was told your job is to sit over there. And while I do all this technical stuff and freak out because I'm not really good at my job and I'm the engineer, you just entertain everyone and make it so that they don't notice. And it's a big song and dance that you do to make that happen. It's incredibly difficult. Difficult. And so doing that for someone else and being a supervising sound editor, I spent a lot of time on the mix stage really just saying, what can I do for my mixer in this social social situation so that they don't have to make small talk while they panic and crawl under a desk, you know, um, because the cables aren't working or the routing got redone by some freelancer the night before or something, some catastrophe is happening. Um, so I do that. And it's even harder when you're asked to do that for yourself. So you're internally panicking because nothing's working. No one else is in the room. It's just you. And you have to be like, oh, so have you tried that brewery down the street? you know, <laughs> the whole time. So I, I would honestly say that is a true skill to be cultivated. And if you can do that and your clients never notice anything ever going wrong, they will come back. That is very true. Um, you know, Joe Barnett, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Very so well. Joe and Bill Smith, one time were working um, on a, a film, we were mixing it digital sound and picture. And, and I was a machine room person at that time. And I just recall my, my ex-husband, he was the chief engineer of the facility and he's in the room with me and he gets called to come to stage C and it's Bill who is just the most even keel person in the world. He's just so mellow and he's just like, yeah, Brian, I, I need you to go up into the, uh, the booth, um, have an issue with picture. And Brian goes up there and the film is literally spooling off <laughs> the projector and he walks in and it's a mountain of film that he's standing in. And, um, the client would not have liked that. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah. So Brian started spooling film back together and, uh, and they just took a, a quick moment where Bill was like, Oh, we're just, we're going to, uh, we're going to change a bulb and I'm just going to keep mixing right now. And, um, yeah, those are skills that are so important for your client to feel like nothing's wrong. Everyone's being taken care of. Your time is valuable. Um, I remember when I had my company, that was the thing that, you know, I would explain to people. I'm like, um, check your ego at the door unless you're paying me <laughs> because, uh, you know, we are here for them. We are here to make what they need to have happen, happen. Panic is not creatively conducive. No, no, but it is contagious. And if it is one, so contagious. and if especially if the person in front of the board, sitting in the front of the room, looks like they're about to lose their shit, stone just, cold. It is everyone in the room is going to be like, so "What cold. is going on here? No it's one knows what good. they're doing. This is a disaster." Yeah. And phone calls will be made in the hallway. My yeah, favorite phrase is, "It's going to be awesome." Yeah, they're already calling <laughs> another facility. Can can you fit us in? Yeah. We're going to switch yeah. stages and. You know, it, it, it's just 
And as a woman, I would say too, and I I don't want to harp on this kind of stuff, but you will be the first one to take the fall. They will say, who is that little lady up there making a mess of this? And the panic that you show is 10 times more than the panic they receive as a female. They will, that is true. They interpret your unsteadiness as bigger than their unsteadiness. But do you, do you, I know I feel this way. I'm curious if you guys feel the same where I feel like I've become more, not assertive in these situations, but more like, I got this under control. Everything's cool. Just take a lot, you know, take your lunch break. We'll be cool. And the thing is, I wouldn't normally talk to people that directly, but I feel like in a situation like that, that, that I tend to be like, you know, time for a union break. Everybody take a lap. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, it's almost like, like what they want to, you know, if if it was a guy, that's probably what they would. Yeah. And they, people want to feel that the situation is under control. So offer a solution, say, this is what is happening. Don't mention the problem. You know, we're all, Hey, we're all going to Porto's. (laughs) <laughs> but every once in a while you get a producer that knows exactly what is going on truth and <laughs> yes it is and not scary. a yeah. time for small talk no. there, and so another like skill is to know when to be playful when to not yeah. this i is mean true. um if we have like a problem most of the time I will text our post supervisor, Mimi in the hallway, my mix partner will keep working. So our director doesn't know. Cause a lot of times the directors don't really know what we do. Like they do, but they don't, they're like, yo, raise the Foley's. And I said, no, I do music, <laughs> you know? Um, so I get but- that too. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I want up signs on the chairs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as long as you're up front, with the money guy and the post supervisor, like, Hey, our computer crashed. If it takes too long, don't worry about it. We'll work it out on the back end. Like I'll, I'll stay on my own time. Like you just make it right and know that they're taken care of. So then he doesn't say me, I need an hour of downtime and then call the studio and then it becomes more of a big deal. Actually thinking about how, um, how to handle this, say, as an assistant or, you know, uh, you're in the machine room, you're, you're the client services person. Like once something's going on on the stage, it's actually a problem for everybody. And that's the thing about working for a studio is it's, it's, um, it's almost like a family where it's like one person's having a problem and everyone still kind of has to come in and help. But you have to know, like, if you're the assistant on the stage, um, you want your mixer to know that you, you have things under control that you're doing something to help fix the problem. You know, a computer is down. Well, the mixer is probably dealing with it, but is there something you can do? Uh, I worked, when I was assisting, um, I remember we had two, some, two of the first D commands in town. So the mixers like literally didn't know how to use them. So there'd be times where they'd be like, you know, come over here and they'd be like, Psst, where do I find the trim for blah, blah, blah. Like they're just features they didn't know. And I'm going, I have no idea what this thing means. I don't know what touch latch means. I've, you know, and, and, but I'm going through the manual, like, okay, that's what this means. And that's where this button is. And then I kind of go back in and and they're working the whole time. Be like, what's this thing, you know, and I could show them what to do. And, and that was actually one of the things that, that I think helped those mixers to be like, we want April we want to give her a chance, you know, like mixer calls and sick, you know what? We want April to give, give it a shot because they knew that I had their back. So then they wanted to have my back, but it's, it's, it's a tough balance to the, between like you, you want to help. But like for me that day where I, I was like, you know, Hey, has anyone tried this computer thing? Because you don't want an intern on their first day being like, you guys couldn't all figure this out. How about this thing? So it's a really like fine line between like, what can I do to help? But wh- what are the boundaries of my job? You know? And you, you do get people where it's uh, someone in client services who could be mixing in theory, you know, but a lot of what you're learning in, in those positions is trust and, um, you know, how to communicate with people and, you know, how to present yourself. And, and, and you know, like Carol was saying, what, uh, should I, should actually, Anna was saying this about, should I be funny right now or should I be serious? And even with clients, you kind of have to feel out, and, and I find this especially um you know, you'll get some people who they want you to be the leader. They want to be like, all right, we're going to do this thing now. And, and they're asking you, well, what do you think about this? And you go, well, I think this is good. Or I, I don't think this is good. But then you get people who they want to be in charge. And at that point, you you are the server. You know, you here is tonight's dinner. What would you like? You know, and it's a very different style of how you communicate with, with the, the people around you. That's hard. Yeah, it takes yeah. practice. <laughs> yeah, I feel like actually... Um, 
and not that I, uh, I'm ever really living in that land of men versus women when it comes to, uh, you know, the work that we do, but I do find, um, having worked in this for 20 years and been around a lot of people, um, I do find that the women have that adaptive aspect, uh, certainly like, you know, the sound supervisors I've been around and the mixers that I've been around, um, they do identify that moment of, okay, we're going to act this way now, or we're going to focus on this right now, um, where it's just like, now's the time for compromise. Um, yeah, and I know uh, at least a couple of us on the panel have, have, have gotten projects with uh, a producer or someone who, who, is, I don't want to say it has a reputation for not being the easiest to work with. <laughs> and that part of why that they connected to you is maybe because as a woman, you okay. weren't threatening or that you could communicate yeah. with them in a way that they connected. And I'm talking men, men or women, you know, yeah. and DC, they, I, they used to tease me that, uh, that I got my job because I, I got along with everybody's clients that they couldn't get along with. Yeah. yeah I, I also have a lot of clients that nobody else wants yeah. and they just keep coming like, back and I can't get I make rid them of them. My friends. But yeah. <laughs> But I think that there's something something really important too about being, everybody says be a good communicator, but like, how do you, how do you accomplish that? But we all have had really, like really difficult clients, I think, who have unreasonable expectations, who maybe need to leave the mix stage all the time, then come in and throw stuff or want to spend the whole mix standing up, like literally over the head of the mixer and (laughs) writing one note per page and flipping them. You know, we've seen it all, but the, when people complain about stuff, um, if you just nod your head and say, okay, okay, you know, you're probably going to get fired, uh, in my opinion. And so what you need to do is they're trying to tell you a problem that they have. And all you have to do, and not all you have to do to keep your job, because, you know, sometimes it's not possible. But a lot of times what's necessary is they just want to be heard, right? And so if you just repeat back to them exactly what they said to you, and then you say, and this is what I'm going to do about it, and then you finish that sentence, that goes like a million miles compared to your average Joe who's sitting in the chair. And you can really, you can save a lot of situations that seem one, like they can't be saved and two, like maybe you don't want to save them um, in that way. And you'll be happy later when you're on hiatus and that person gives you a call again and you think you never wanted to work with them. And, and then it turns out that you did. And a lot of times you can build a trust. I've had people who start out where you're like, so I hear what you're saying and you're feeling this. So I'm going to do that. And I think it's going to address this. I I will take, I I got you. Right. It starts out that way. Years later, you're like, yeah, I got you. It's cool. All right, sweet. I'm going to go get coffee. Totally different situation. You build trust. So, um, I feel like, uh, we've, we've touched on the aspects of skills that are needed. Um, we've identified some of the different roles that you're going to play, uh, you know, in the position that you're in. Um, I had some other questions, but I feel like in a way, uh, we've, we've kind of gone into a different path here, um, (laughs) which is perfect. Um, (laughs) and, um, you know, our, since our original intent was definitely to, uh, address what's important to you guys, um, who might be wanting to get into post, or do a career change, um, I think now would actually be a good time to open to some questions that are a little more specific to what's important for you to know. Hi, my name is Jasmine Espy, and I currently go to USC, and I'm doing my master's in journalism arts. And so I want to be a documentarian, but I've also, for since I was in high school, have done um, post-production and recording you know, um, work and whatnot. And so I got into tracking um, and recording back in Detroit where my hometown is. And I'm wondering how practical is it for me to want to balance both of those and to be a documentarian, but also wanting to get into post-production and do that type of hustle as well. I know two mixers who are documentary makers. And it's funny because I think the the mixing comes first for them or it came first. And then it was just like, I have this thing I have a passion about and I think you naturally learn 
no matter where you are in the industry, like you're going to learn other stuff. You know, you're going to, as a, as an audio person, like I work, my, my uh, department that I work in, we have three audio mixers and like 10 editors. So I'm hanging out with editors all day. I can go in the room and kind of see how they're doing stuff. And they do the same with me. So I, I think it's, it's totally, it's totally doable. It's just a matter of like, what path do you want to go down to pay the bills? And what is the passion project that, you know, is it the documentary that could be on the side and, and, you know, might take a few years or do you want to really go on that and just kind of do the, the post-production stuff on the side, but doing both together where it's like today I'm going to be a post-production mixer and tomorrow I'm going to be, you know, out on a documentary shoot. I don't know how tough that would be. I would also maybe, I'm all about killing two birds with one stone. Um, so, uh, maybe you can focus your, uh, you know, look for filmmakers or producers to work with in the post environment that are also documentary makers. That way you can learn about distribution and you can learn about how they come up with their funding and how they organize their, their situation. So not only will you have a crew to draw on that has the experience when you make your documentary, um, but you will also be picking up useful information to help that secondary passion. And you may find that you might be super fab at what you do in post for the thing that you have passion for privately. So you may find it, that you're invaluable for documentaries as someone who is intrinsically a documentary maker. Yeah, and I would add to it that uh, you know you're gonna you're gonna have more of your story happening by being in that process of uh, making the documentary, and then also being in that post aspect as well. Whether it's you doing it all yourself or just uh, being aware of what's involved in it and knowing who to uh, bring on for the work that's being done. Picture editor is also going to be your lifeblood for a documentary. A good picture editor. That's a lot of work. Good yeah. production sound guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions? Or gal. Or gal. I used to all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there's sort of a separation between music as in like even for for a film. So all of us, you know, if we're on the stage or even as a supervisor sound editor, um, we receive all the elements, which would be Foley, sound effects, dialogue, voiceover, music. Um, the team that works on everything but music tends to be, you know, that's kind of us. It's, it's, um, and people that we work with. The music team tends to be, you know, you get the, the composer works with, uh, they hire their own scoring mixer and then that they might hire their own music editor. So even on the stage, you know, we might, it might be a whole company. It might be like, you know, Warner Brothers is providing the sound editorial and the mixer um, and the Foley, but the music, the music editor is coming from an outside company. Most of the time music editor is tied with a composer. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why, I mean, do you, do you try to do music work at all anymore? Or? Rarely. Um, I did something at Ocean Way not too long ago, um, but not so much, not so much anymore. Yeah, I guess it. Yeah, it's 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 so it's similar. It's a different beast. To, it's kind of similar to what I was saying that that um, you pick. You kind of have to pick the thing that's going to pay the bills, and 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 that can be something you're passionate about. But like, if you really are passionate about two or three different things, and you, and it's you got to find things that play nice with each other. And post production, all these jobs, you know, Foley effects, sound sound designer, sound editor, you know. ADR engineer, those all play nice together. And that's why for me, like I've been able to be like an ADR mixer and a fully editor and, or, you know, or like Carol, like where you do a movie and you could do everything yeah. yourself except, well, you could be, you could do the music editing, but you probably wouldn't be oh, yeah. recording the score. I, I just did a, um, I just did the music editorial actually, um, for a pilot that's going to be on Comedy Central, uh, called Robbie. It's actually kind of awesome. You guys should check it out. Yes. <laughs> but, but I, I, I was the re-recording mixer and because I was supervising the pilot, um, and because it was, uh, it was a certain amount of budget that Comedy Central had before they were going to purchase more based on the response, watch the pilot, um, <laughs> um, that I, I ended up being the music editor and yeah, it wasn't, it, you know, it ain't no thing. I got a composition minor. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
We do get music on stage, though. Like, you know, like, uh, for instance, especially in two mixer situations, like uh, Anna Lee and I work on most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're both dialogue and music kind of specialists in that two team, typically. Not that I don't do effects sometimes and not that she doesn't do it. But, you know, we pretty much mm -hmm. we're kind of dealing with, you know, chatter and boom. You know, it's you know, music and, and chatter, right? Um, and we'll get stuff from the uh, what we typically get from our composers is, is something that's mixed to and balanced to something that is a cohesive musical piece. Um, but we will get them in certain splits, usually separated by frequencies, sometimes by instrument frequencies better. Um, and we will uh, uh, mesh that to the to the, the picture, meaning um, when everything comes together, like backgrounds and sound effects and Foley and dialogue and all that stuff is coming together. Sometimes you find that that amazing horn that just spoke to the you know integrity of the main you know protagonist all of a sudden just goes right over his dialogue. And nobody knows what he's really passionate about. Um, so you know, kind of you're able to pull down that one element, or you know, and keep everything up and kind of weave and bob it. But that is still a post process of sound. It's not a a production in creation yeah, of the music. Music engineering. You could go the music route and go to the music studios. There's a ton in Los Angeles, and they're all working. Um, the only problem with that which I found is there you get paid much less than you would in post-production. Um, assistant engineer, maybe you could get maybe 30 bucks an hour for, or maybe, you know, an engineer, maybe about 40 um, for a mixed tech who's coming in. I think the union scale is 56 bucks an hour. Darling, that way. I think uh, on a daily call. Yeah. 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 So, and, and there's unions and when you work in post, if you work a week, you get paid the next week. Unlike in music, you work and, and you, you get hope. paid in two weeks or you could get paid in six months. It just depends on. Yeah. Um, I would say, uh, and I don't know if this applies to your question at all, but, um, I, I get questions a lot since I run the motion picture sound editors. I'll get people asking me about um, just how to get into the industry, places to contact for various types of job uh, opportunities. And um, I would say the people that are working in the music industry and they still have a passion for working in that music industry, but maybe they want to get out of the recording studio, they're burnt out or life changes or whatever, um, getting into music editorial is a very natural pathway, I think, for a lot of people that are uh, recording engineers. Um, and it's something that you can think about. And working as a music editor, you're going to be working with composers, you're going to be working with music. It's a very dynamic position. Yeah. yeah. You're on the dub stage even after you spend the time with the composer. You're in the spotting sessions where the producers are explaining what it is that they want in their music and what they want in their sound effects uh, before it even goes through the editorial post process. Um, when you're on the dub stage, you're not only there to ensure that the composer is represented and the things that were important to the producers and that were communicated to the composer are follow through to the final mix, but you're also there to solve rhythmic problems with when everything comes together or if there's a nip tuck in the picture. It's a very dynamic and very cool position. Yeah, and, and like I remember I worked on a pilot, um, uh, the, the crazy ones, where we had this scene that they, I was the music editor, and they had me recut. Uh, so basically as a music editor, you're working with the editor and the producer. So I was actually like, you know, not at a sound facility. I think I recut one cue for the opening 30, 40 times. I mean, it was something that like, I knew that they were very particular about. And there was another cue that they had the composers do 10 different versions. Cause there was just this one little thing. But the thing is when everything got sent to the mix stage and the mixers just kind of, you know, they just go along like, okay, music, you know, but they don't know the history of this five seconds. And so for me, I'm going, okay, when the producer shows up later, that's the one thing they're going to listen to. They're going to, they're going to want to hear that one symbol because we went over this for freaking three weeks. You know what I mean? So that's really the importance of having a music editor on the stage is they really know the history of the music and, and the, the, to, to hold the integrity of the music and to make sure that the mixer's not, you know, dropping it too low. I mean, I, I know there, I don't know how often you get music editors telling you that, but there's times where, where I legit would be like, Hey, could, is there any room to bring this up a little bit? How about we bring this stem down so we can bring the whole cue up? 
And that's the value of, of, incur of, of delivering stems is like, you know, we can either take one file and bring the whole thing down or we can take yeah, your, your stems are there so we can make your music present, not so that we can take better. it away. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Ooh, good. And then you. Hi, uh, my name is also Jasmine. Um, I uh, am aspiring to break into the post sound world and have been for a while. So hearing all of your stories is very encouraging because I think it can be a challenge sometimes to envision a future where any of that happens. <laughs> um, but I guess my question for you is, um, since you've all been doing this for a while now, if, if you had to start again today, presently as the industry is, is there anything that you would change about your approach to getting onto this path? Um, and is there any advice that you'd give to someone? That's a great, question. That's a great question. <laughs> Don't be so hard headed. <laughs> I was one of those people who were like, I'm going to sound supervise your movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's once. great to have tenacity you just need to know like when to reel it in yeah. <laughs> I think I would have been more tenacious actually yeah like I was always uh, for a very long time in my career I felt like if I was just the productivity engine the dependability engine that the opportunities were going to come towards me and while that's required to have those opportunities to come towards you you need to speak up and it was actually a producer that said to me uh, you know that you need to you need to stand up. You need to raise your hand. You need to say, what is it that you want? So, yeah, I think I would have done that earlier. I think I would have left D.C. earlier and put my butt in the wind of L.A. <laughs> Tried it again because it's, it's terrifying. But um, it, it was a good thing. Um, and I would say just since you're starting out in your career, I do think that it's, it's important. You've heard all of us talk about all the crappy jobs that we had along the way, all the things that we thought maybe weren't really getting us to that end point. And none of us are that old and we all got there. So it's really important to keep in mind that like you have some time, that old. It, it'll happen. And so you don't need to start at the top. And not only do you not need to, you're not going to start at the top. So don't beat yourself up when you start at the bottom. You should coming out of school or coming out of, you know, a technical program or coming maybe from a different career, expect to have an entry level position. And that doesn't mean that it needs to be a crap position. It just, that just means that it's appropriate appropriate for the amount of experience that you have. So I'm talking working in the machine room, being a mixed tech, um, being an assistant, making the coffee, doing the scheduling. Those are all things that like April and Annalie talked about. They, they put you in a position to learn so much about all the inner workings of a studio, all the inner workings of a production, how to handle people, who's who. And also it gives you the opportunity to see all of the jobs because you're not going to want all the jobs. That's the biggest thing that you can learn, especially from like a bad job is you can learn exactly what not to do. Like when I'm the boss, I'm not going to treat people like this way. When I'm the boss, I'm going to pay people on time or, you know, I hated every single Foley session that I attended, but I loved doing dialogue editorial. Those are things that you learn when you're in those entry level positions because you're exposed to such a wider swath of what's going on. And rather than pigeonholing yourself into like, I'm going to be the next premier sound effects editor, you know, when you just got out of school, that's, it, it, that's really not the best place for you to start your career either. So just keep an open mind and know that every single day that you come to your job, you can learn something new and you can also work really hard and be noticed. You know, I was a secretary and at my first job and I got promoted within one month because I used to come in and I would stay late every day. I would come in early. I would ask every single day, who can I observe today? Can I, while I'm eating my lunch, can I sit in on a mix? I'm going to, you know, I get told go home and I would say, no, I think I'm going to stay and I'm going to check all of your cables for you. <laughs> and those are the things that I did. And, and that does not go unnoticed because you're, you're not just saying what, what am I doing for my career every day that you're in your job? Instead, you're saying, what can I do to make your job easier for you? And take, do a ton of different jobs. Yeah. Be a sound designer, be a post supervisor, be a runner, be yeah. just Try everything because that makes you realize who you are as a person. 
Yeah. Also, I just, uh, what would you say, uh, Anna, is the average age of people who do our job? Would you say it's like, it's probably like late 50s, like to mid 60s, maybe? Would you, would you say it's about mid 50s, maybe? Yeah, 50, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like, I don't know. There's a there's a all I, we picked a job where we're, we're, we're like forty is a new twenty five, you know. <laughs> so like, you know? Yeah, she's gonna say that time. next year too. I'm just saying, there's you know, there's no you have plenty of time. There's many you have expiration it, 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 that you can do. You have time. It's funny if you talk to those guys and you say, hey, you know, where where did you get started? And they're all you know, if you didn't work at Sony or Warner Brothers or Tadeo or whatever, like they all kind of went through the same similar set of studios. And so I think that my advice would be you don't have to go to a named studio anymore because you think about it it's not like every single netflix show is going to you know fox or whatever it, it's or obviously wouldn't go to fox but to you know xyz studio you, you know what i mean like it used to be like these are the hot places to go for big shows and there are still big shows that go to these places but you know the amount of content i think netflix is making how many billions of dollars worth 90 of 90 original tv series yeah year. so i actually i met a few months ago uh, a girl named daniel price who is a sound editor and and oh, do you know daniel yeah and so she graduated maybe a year or two ago came out here you know i you know she was just wanted to meet people in sound sent me an email like you know hey you know, let's meet up for dinner and and, uh, and she's like, yeah, I'm working for this studio. I couldn't even tell you the name of it right now. Uh, it's a small place, like three people. We, you know, we just worked on this documentary series for Netflix. It's called Wild Wild Country. And I'm like, huh, that sounds kind of interesting. She just got an Emmy nomination, you know, year out of school. And, and um, it just goes to show like good content can show up anywhere. And you have no control over, you know, like that something you're going to work on is going to turn into something great. You know what I mean? Yeah, and there's um, sometimes there's the question of, uh, oh, well, should I work in a union facility or a non-union facility? And really, I mean, I feel like the key first is work. And then, um, but what I can attest to, um, having worked for non-union and union places, and I had a non-union and a union facility, um, is as non-union there's a lot of opportunity to wear multiple hats because uh, usually it's just sort of like, look, so-and-so didn't show up and I need this done. And, um, or, you know, like, uh, <laughs> I can't tell you how many movies I've voiced in because <laughs> it's friends and family loop group, you know, that sort of thing. Or, you know, the actress isn't going to come and do just those three lines. So can you cover it for the temp? Um, and so there's like these different things that you can get thrown into a lot easier uh, in a non-union facility. I, I actually recommend if you're starting out that that's a great place to go to because I did that. Yeah, yeah I did non-union and then I did union. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. And people who come when I worked at when I was sound supervising at Warner Brothers, it was you know people would email me like young women or, or guys and say, you know, I want to work on your show or whatever. And I would just say, we can't, we can't hire you. You know, you're not in the Who union. Are you? <laughs> you have, you have no experience. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot harder to break into that. And, and you don't get those random opportunities thrown and, at you and that's in the middle of the night. A really good point about don't ever ask anyone. Well, I would say don't ever ask anyone for a job. You know, I would, I tend to go under like, you know, Hey, Kate, you know, hey, I, I really like your blog. Do you want to meet for lunch sometime? You know what I mean? And use that as an opening and then and then be like, you know, how did you get to where you are? Like, could you tell me more about your career? And and the things people love to, sh to share about themselves. And, and there's something you're going to learn from from everybody. Um, I think that's so much going to get you further than messaging someone on LinkedIn and saying, hey, do you have an internship? I'm looking for for work right now. 